Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our online worship experience here at Faith Free Will Baptist Church in Chandler. We're so glad that you could join us this morning. We really are. We're trying to do the best we can at reaching out to people during this trying time. So if you would, please let us know with a comment, um, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, and uh, where you're at and who you're watching with, maybe family, friends, neighbors, and, and feel free to share this video with anyone you can think of that might uh, benefit from it. We've got a great worship experience lined up. We've got our worship team to be leading us in some worship music from their homes, of course, due to all the uh, safety measures, which is good. We're also going to try to articulate our uh, how our message is continuing to make a difference in our mission of our church here in Chandler and our surrounding area. Uh, so, like I said, if you want to, if you have a specific prayer request or a question about our church or uh, anything like that, feel free to send a question in a comment and we will get you an answer. So, once again, thanks for being here and may God bless and enjoy the service.
Hey, super cool news. Our worship teams have started recording here in the gym, which means that next Sunday we'll be moving into step two, which is we continue to worship from home, but our worship teams are providing the worship, leading us in worship, recording together here. And that only moves us into step two, but it prepares us to step four, for step four when everybody will be able to gather for worship here in the gym. Now, the step in between, step three, is you will invite people to join you in your home to watch worship. And maybe this is people that you're already seeing on a regular basis. Maybe it's folks from church that you that you have a relationship with, or maybe it's a friend, neighbor, relative that doesn't attend church, but maybe they would come and participate in the worship experience with you uh, in your home. And so we're going to move into step two next Sunday, and then step three will follow that. Of course, while we can't meet in person, our mission has continued to move forward. We've continued to pour out the message of the gospel, and try to deliver hope to all of those around us. And you're making that possible by continuing to support us so incredibly faithful. I have been blown away at your faithfulness. So thank you to all of you who are continuing to give online at faithinchandler.com slash give using the Venmo app and giving to Faith FWB Church. Those of you that are texting in to give, and then of course those of you that are mailing in offerings and tithes Uh, to our address here at the church, 303 North 5th Street in Chandler, Indiana. Of course, as the mission moves forward, we want to be very clear on what that mission is. And it's changed lives. It's people's lives being transformed by the message of the gospel. And so Pastor Eric was able to interview Chris this week about how God has transformed his life through the gospel and what our church has been able to to see God Um, do in Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Duncan. What's up, Chris? So... Chris is going to share his story with us. Um, so Chris, I just want to start out with whenever uh, you were a kid, um, what was the general feeling of um, your household, their attitude towards Jesus whenever you were a kid? Um, I mean, I, I grew up with my grandparents for the most part, and uh, – I went to a Catholic school for the first few years of elementary and um, like I grew up in the, the, the Catholic denomination and got confirmed and went through all of that. So when do you think that things started to slip away as far as your keeping your eyes on Jesus? And- With how I was brought up, you know, like it, the foundation was laid down of Christianity, but it was kind of something that I felt like uh, I didn't really understand and I was just kind of jumping through the hoops. But once I became old enough to uh, make my own decisions, I guess I, I didn't follow, follow Christianity. You know, I I started asking questions and um, I basically became agnostic for the most part. You know, I still, I still believed in, some kind of higher power or something, but I, I didn't have any, any direction with, with any of that. So like once I was old enough and went to, went to college, I started looking around at different, um, different religions and types of belief, I guess. Mm-hmm. So do you think up to that point in, in your life, um, you, you knew Jesus or did you just know, like about the faith. Yeah, I I don't consider um, really knowing Jesus. I mean, I guess I, I knew him as a as a character or some an important historical figure or some kind of uh, teacher. I guess you know I recognize like that, but I didn't actually have any real relationship with him until many years later. I mean, I was I was a full adult whenever. Uh, whenever I came, came back to my faith, you know, I went through a real rough past or a rough time in my past and I didn't have any, any relationship with, with Jesus. But I think, uh, so as much as you'd like to describe, describe that time in your life, whenever you, so you had kind of abandoned the faith of your childhood, you'd kind of learned enough and not got enough answers to where you were like, I don't know, maybe, maybe these other religions are true. Maybe there's a God out there, but who knows what truth is, what happened after that point? Um, really, I, I went through a lot of years of, uh, 
uh, struggling with addiction and I, I had this, I had this moment where, um, where I, I needed help. I was ready to stop, you know, and I, I hit my knees and prayed to, prayed to God. At that moment, I didn't know what God was. I prayed to whatever could, could help me, you know, and it wasn't long after that, that, um, my cousins invited me to come to, to faith church and, uh, I started to be more open-minded and I started to accept Christ. And I, I don't know, it was like a, a real transformation from that point. Whenever you came to faith, um, you came because you had family here who had invited you. Um, how did you feel about faith whenever, whenever you first got here? From the beginning, I felt like welcome. You know, I felt welcome there. And even though, you know, I had no self-esteem and I, I felt like I, you know, I looked, looked terrible from, you know, just coming out of a addiction, like, but I think I, I really did feel, feel welcome. And I felt like the, the message was really trying to, trying to reach me. And that's when I, I joined a discipleship group and sitting down and studying with, with those group of guys, um, you know, they're with the discipleship thing, there's a lot of honesty and uh, some confession and, uh, a lot of learning that, that happened. And it really, it really helped me like through that. Yeah. So what was that like, uh, to jump into discipleship after all that time away from Jesus and from the church? Um, I mean, I, I feel kind of bad for the group that I was in, you know, uh, I had a lot of, a lot of questions and I, I know that we, we haven't, you know, an attitude that no question is stupid, but I had a lot of, uh, really, I had a lot of questions and I'm, I'm fortunate that the, the group bared with me through a lot of that. And just, it, it's, it was more about, uh, a group of guys getting down and studying and forming a relationship with each other. And, you know, the, uh, the trust and the, the honesty and somebody to talk to was, was just as important as the actual study. And that was a, that was a huge help for me. And it just, it, it strengthened and really brought me even closer to Christ by doing that. Absolutely. That's awesome. So did you feel like your coming to know who Jesus really was, was more of a process or do you, do you remember like a distinct moment whenever things changed for you? Well, it was, uh, it was definitely a process for me, you know, but I think, um, I think it's, it's a little of both. Like it was a process learning and growing and building that relationship, but I think, uh, you know, whenever I had that moment where I, I surrendered and accepted Christ into my heart, it, it really did make a, make a big change within me, you know. But later on, growing that, that relationship with Christ, it was a process and it took, took some time and understanding. But, you know, I'm, I, can't even, um, I can't even imagine the life I'm living today without without that that uh that relationship with Christ
Hey, so one of the values of Faith Church is that we are not merely in Chandler, but we are for Chandler. And I know that some of you are watching from all over the country, some of you watching from Evansville, Newburgh, Chandler, Boonville, that are local. We feel like God has placed us right here in this community with the connections that we have uh, for a purpose, for a reason. And so we're not just in Chandler, we're for Chandler. And part of that is the fact that some of the people that we have ministered to here in Chandler have connected with you, those that are not in Chandler. And so God is using that, that value, that passion that we have to minister in Chandler to make an impact outside of Chandler. And we're so thankful for that. And right now, that continues. We continue to hold that value dear. We continue to minister in Chandler and be for Chandler. And Today's message is all about how exiles are to be for their city and how we are to be for the community where God has placed us because this is not our home. We have a home that's on the other side. And so today's message is all about how to be exiles for the city. And for us as Faith Church, that means being for Chandler. You know, i got to be honest, when I uh, first moved to Chandler, or a couple years into our time here in Chandler, I went through a little bit of a period where um, I didn't really love Chandler. Like, I loved people, and I wanted to reach people with the gospel, but um, I had this idea in my head of when I moved to Chandler, it was going to be like this small town feel, you know. I'd grown up in Nashville and Virginia Beach, Virginia, and so I expected there to be, like, the Andy Griffith show, Mayberry-type feel. And then when I got here to Chandler, uh, Chandler is not Mayberry. For those of you who don't live in Chandler, it, it's, it's not Mayberry. But Chandler's got uh, some great attributes, but there are some times that Chandler can be hard to love, right? I mean, probably every one of us in our lives, we have someone that we love, but they, they frustrate us a little bit. Um, perhaps you have a relationship with a child like that. They're, they're, they, you love them, but boy, they kind of test your patience sometimes. And that was, that was a little bit of my experience with Chandler. And so I'd grown a little bit of this angst, uh, a little bit of this, this angst in my heart about, about our town. And it was about this time that I read a book uh, entitled For the City. It was written by Darren Patrick and Matt Carter. And it really convicted me. It really challenged my heart. And and I, I, I read that book, and in the book, Matt Carter has a chapter where he writes about Jeremiah 29. And most people, they think of Jeremiah 29, they think of the verse of Scripture that says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil. And so a lot of people quote that verse, God has good plans for us, but what they don't recognize is what comes right before that verse of scripture. What happens right before Jeremiah gives this promise of the Lord that I have good plans for you? You see, Jeremiah was writing to people in exile. In fact, oh, what he says is in, in the beginning of the letter, these are the words of the prophet sent from Jerusalem to those in exile. And then in verse 4, just in case we, we missed it, verse 4 says this of Jeremiah 29, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I've caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord hopes to those people who are in exile. They've been carried away out of Jerusalem. They've been forced to live in Babylon. They're living in tents and shanties along these irrigation canals, uh, in these agricultural fields where they're being forced to work on the farms to supply Babylon with all of their food, to supply the army with all of their food. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. 
take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there, not diminished. And so what Jeremiah tells the people, he says, listen, I want you to go ahead and settle in. I want you to build houses. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to go ahead and settle in. I want you to take wives. I want you to give your sons and daughters as, as husbands and wives so that they may bear children. And I don't want you to diminish as a people. Rather, I want you to grow. I want you to multiply. I want you to become flourishing. And, and, and most of that probably would not be super surprising for people who are like, okay, we're going to be here for a while. We need to kind of settle in and do life here. But the next verse, verse 7, is incredibly surprising, especially when you know where these people are at. Because verse 7 says, And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. Jeremiah says to the people who have been carried away into captivity in Babylon, seek the peace of that city. And it literally means the shalom, that Jewish word for peace, shalom, Seek the shalom of that city. And the, the Jewish idea of shalom or peace is not just there's an absence of conflict, but rather there's not only an absence of conflict, but in that opening, that absence of conflict, there is growth and flourishing and goodness. And so what, what Jeremiah is telling them is that they should be people who are seeking to see the city where they're in flourish, to do good unto the people who are around them. And what Mac Harder said in his book, For the City, is he was talking about the place where he was at, and he had a little bit of a, a similar relationship to the place where he was, kind of like I was having this angst with, with our location in Chandler. And he had come across Jeremiah 29, and it had really spoke to his heart. And he pointed out what he had noticed is there, there are four kinds of churches. There's the church that is in a city. And a church that's in a city is like that church, they meet, and it just so happens that they're addressed is in that city. It, it's their location, but that's really, that's all that it is. And a lot of times there are churches that are in a city, and a lot of people don't even come from that city, but then maybe they come from a neighboring suburbs or whatever, but that city where the church is just happens to be where they found some land, or there was a place where someone gave them some land so that they could build a, a church facility. So they're in a city. Uh, then there are churches that are against their city. The churches that they're almost antagonistic towards their city. They view themselves as the good guy. The city is the bad guys. And so they're constantly railing against the city. Um, they're kind of picking fights with the city. They're constantly working against the city. The third type is the type that's with the city. And that's the church that they have so capitulated to the culture of their city or their town. They've so um, uh, bent to the ways of, of the world that you can't even tell the difference between the city and the church. That, that they have they've compromised their, their truth, they've compromised their doctrine, they've compromised their belief, so that they can just kind of kind of come alongside the city, and they're just with them. And you can't tell the difference between the two. Now, the people in exile are in Babylon, and it, it could have been that they had the, uh, the, the mentality or the attitude, this is just where we're at, and this is where we have to be for this time period. We're just going to... Just going to deal with it. Or they could have been like, we're against, we're going to constantly look for ways to subvert the Babylonians to work against them. We're going to look for opportunities to assassinate their leaders. We're, we're going to bring sabotage. Or they could have said, listen, this is where we live now. And if this is where God wants us to be, it's where he wants us to be. So we're just going to blend into the life of the Babylonians and accept their gods as our gods, accept their truth as our truth, accept their culture as our culture. But what Jeremiah calls the, the exiles to do is something that's radically different from all of that. He calls them to be for the city they're in. Not to blend in with it, not to rail against it, not to view this just as a time where they happen to be there, but to be for it and to seek the peace, the flourishing of that city that they were in. And a lot of times people have this idea in their minds that to be for a city means that you have to be with it. But the Jews were to continue to maintain their identity as a people who were separate, a people who were God's chosen people. They were going to continue to be separate from the Babylonians, but they were going to be for the Babylonians while they were there. They were going to seek the peace and the flourishing of that city. And that must have been incredibly difficult. 
That must have been so hard because here Jeremiah refers to them as people who have been taken away as captives. They're having to, to serve and pray for and seek the peace of people who want to subjugate them, people who have taken advantage of them. They're praying for their enemies. Does that sound like somebody? That sounds like what Jesus said, right? And, and there, there's, a, there's a book written about this, this period of time, this, this exile, and, and the book refers to what they were called to do, what they were called to loyal subversion. They were, they were to kind of find this, this fine line between rebellion and total allegiance and be loyal, loyally subversive. They weren't going to go along with everything that the city did, but they were going to be for the city. The Bible Project has another great video on how we as exiles in this world and this life, we can be loyally subversive. We're going to check that out now. In the year 587 BC, the city of Jerusalem was attacked by the Babylonian Empire. And a year later, the city and the temple were plundered and burned. Thousands of Israelites were taken from their homes and relocated all over ancient Babylon. They became exiles. And so now they're a minority surrounded by a new culture with new gods. Now, some Israelites chose to resist Babylon by revolting or withdrawing. Others gave in, adopting the Babylonian way of life and accepting these new gods as their own. And you might think those are your only two options, but the prophet Jeremiah told them to do something totally different and surprising. To settle in, build houses, plant gardens, grow families, and most surprisingly, to seek the well-being of Babylon and pray to the Lord on its behalf. So this is like a third way. Yeah, it's not compromise or revolt. What does it look like? Well, there's a whole book of the Bible that explores that question. It's the story of Daniel. Daniel was one of the Israelites taken into the Babylonian exile. And because Daniel had a royal heritage and education, he was recruited along with some friends to work in the high court of Babylon. Work for the enemy? That would be compromise. Or they could gain the king's trust and take him down from the inside. That's what you might expect. But instead, they take Jeremiah's advice and choose the third way. They serve the king of Babylon, taking on Babylonian names and even clothing style. So they seek Babylon's well-being. But in doing so, aren't they just giving up their heritage? It could seem that way, but actually they aren't. As you read on, the story focuses on moments where they draw the line and they choose faithfulness to their God and resist the influence of Babylon. So, for example? Well, like when they're commanded to bow down to the idol of Babylon and give allegiance to the king as if he's a god. Ah, they won't go that far. Right. This is where you see their true loyalty. It requires them to critique Babylon's idolatry of power, its arrogance, its injustice. But they do it nonviolently by laying down their lives. And so God vindicates Daniel and his friends for their faithfulness. So they would serve Babylon, seek its well-being, but their loyalty was always to God. Yeah, this is what Jeremiah was envisioning. The way of the exile is a combination of loyalty and also subversion. So they're still exiles, but don't Daniel and his friends long to go home? Yes. In fact, Daniel believed that God was going to send a ruler to bring down Babylon and create a true kingdom of peace. Ah, when did he think this ruler would come? Well, at first he thought within his lifetime. But then he had a dream where he found out that after Babylon would come another oppressive empire, then another, then another. And so Babylon did fall, and Israel did get to go back home. But now they're ruled by Babylon's successors. And so they maintained the mindset of an exile, waiting for their true home to come to them. And they continued the same practice of loyalty and subversion to any new versions of Babylon that came along. And this leads us to the time of Jesus. The empire of his day was Rome, ruled by Caesar. Now, some Israelites wanted to resist, while others gave in and adopted Roman culture and its gods. But watch Jesus carry on the subversive loyalty of Daniel. Like when he said, it's fine to pay taxes to Caesar, give him back his coins. But then he said, don't mistake Caesar for God. God's the one who deserves your total life and allegiance. So the way of Jesus is this same mix of loyalty and subversion. Yeah, like he taught his followers to love and even bless their enemies. But he also got arrested for speaking out against the corrupt leaders of Jerusalem and Rome. He critiqued their idolatry of power and it cost him his life. But God vindicated him by raising him from the dead as the true king of the nations. The king that Daniel had hoped for. 
Right. And Jesus promised that one day his kingdom would prevail. And so until then, his followers are living in a type of exile. Yeah, this is why the Apostle Peter calls followers of Jesus foreigners and exiles. He told them to respect the authorities of whatever place you happen to live, to honor and love all people. But then he reminds them that this isn't their true home. They're still living in Babylon. But, well, they're not living in Babylon. Babylon doesn't exist anymore. Or does it? In the Bible, Babylon has become a symbol that describes any human institution that demands allegiance to its idolatrous redefinitions of good and evil. Okay, so we all live and work in Babylon. How do I seek the well-being of Babylon while my allegiance is to someone greater? Yes, Jesus' followers are called to live in that tension between loyalty and subversion. That's the way of the exile. So when Jeremiah writes this letter, he writes this prophecy to the people who are exiles in Babylon. He writes this letter to the people who have been carried away as captives. There were some people who really didn't like it. In fact, Jeremiah was an incredibly unpopular prophet. And he was unpopular because he always told the truth. Whatever God told him to say, he would say, whether it was popular or not. And and Jeremiah is referred to as the weeping prophet because he was constantly having to deliver bad news. He was constantly having to deliver news of the people being carried away as captives, delivering news that they were going to be in captivity for 70 years, and people didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear that message. And so they chose to rather instead listen to prophets like this guy named Hananiah. There were these false prophets who they didn't deliver messages that God had given them, but rather they delivered messages of what they knew the people wanted to hear. Verse 8 says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams you caused to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed in Babylon, then you will return. So these prophets are saying, listen, God's going gonna, gonna to come back and he's, he's going he's gonna to give us victory over the Babylonians. He's going to bring us home. He's going to rebuild his city. This is all going to happen really soon. And the people are like, yes, that is what we want to hear. But God hadn't given them that message. And so Jeremiah has to deliver this message of, God is going to bring you back one day, but not yet. God is going to bring you back one day, but not now. And that message was incredibly unpopular. And because Jeremiah constantly delivered these unpopular prophecies, the people uh, imprisoned him, they would eventually kill him, because he simply told them the truth. And what's sad is that because Jeremiah told the truth, he was viewed as an enemy. And right now we have this crazy thing happening in our culture where anything that someone says is automatically tied to one political platform or another. Like, right now, even this crisis that we're in, it has been politicized because it's an election year and there's an election coming up. It's been politicized to the point that whatever stance you might take on the virus is somehow connected to your political affiliation. And, And a lot of pastors have kind of found themselves in the same place as Jeremiah. They feel like they're doing what's right, what's going to be a blessing to, to their people, but people are just saying, well, you're, you're liberal, or you're conservative, or you're compromising, or you don't care about people. And we've, we've come to this place in our nation where research has become finding what we want to be true on the internet and saying we found sources. That's what the people did in this day. They went searching for what they wanted to hear. And they decided that the prophet who said the thing that they liked must be the right one. Jeremiah delivers them a message that is difficult. It's hard, but it's true. And what he calls them to do is to settle in to this exile and this captivity, and in the middle of their exile and captivity, to care for the city that they're in, to love the city. They're to show compassion. And some people would call that compromise. And know this, that when we show compassion to our neighbors, when we show compassion to our friends, there are going to be enemies who attack us and call us compromises. There are going to be people that just look for a reason to to be against us. There are going to be people who look for a reason to oppose us. 
because they don't like what we're doing, they don't like what we stand for, they don't like our message, they don't like the truth of the gospel, and we can't compromise those truths, those truths, those parts that they don't like. So, like, a really, like, silly example of this is that years ago, um, I had posted something online about we, we, we did this thing, and I said, we have done this because we love our city. And a guy commented, Chandler's not a city, it's a town. Okay. <laughs> we love our town. We did this because we love our town. Like, I, I wasn't trying to emphasize the fact that Chandler is a city or a town or the size of it or anything like that. I was just trying to say, hey, we're doing this because we love our town. And people will look for a reason to be upset or look for a reason to oppose. They'll look for a reason to start a fight. And when the people didn't like what Jeremiah had to say, because he, he, he showed compassion, he showed love, but he also spoke the truth, and people didn't like it. And we are to be for our city, but we've got to recognize that when we are for our city, when we are for the people around us, that maybe they disagree with us, maybe they don't believe the same thing, when we are for them and we, we care for them and we love them, but we also tell them the truth, there are going to be people who oppose that because they don't like the truth. They don't like the message that we're sharing. Right now, you and I, we have this opportunity to live out our faith in a very genuine way. We, we have the, the best opportunity of our lifetimes to show our community that we care for them by caring for their need, needs, meeting their needs in the middle of this crisis. And, and you know what's crazy about the, the exile? What the Bible tells us is the reason that they ended up in exile is because when they were going to worship, they were worshiping with, without a genuineness or an authenticity. Amos has several uh, prophecies from, from this time where he talks about the fact that they were coming in to worship in the house of the Lord and they were singing songs, singing psalms, they were offering sacrifices, but because at the same time that they were doing these things, they were taking advantage of the poor, they were subjugating these people. Because of this, God didn't want to hear their songs or to smell their burnt offerings. You ever been like working out in your yard and you smell like, Oh, somebody's grilling, somebody's barbecuing. Oh, it smells amazing. Like, it's almost mouth-watering because you can smell somebody else grilling. You're like, man, I'm going to have to go over and see what the neighbors are up to. That when the people would offer a sacrifice in the temple, it was to give this sweet-smelling, the sweet, savory smell. And it was to rise up before the Lord and be this sweet-smelling sacrifice. But what the God says in Amos is that because they, they would take advantage of the poor... And, and rob from them and, and force them into labor and pay them wages that were not fair and, and demand high rent from them because they would do that and then walk in and offer sacrifices. Their sacrifices didn't smell like a good barbecue. Their sacrifices smelled like dung. Their sacrifices smelled like garbage. It was awful. And the reason they find themselves in captivity and exile is because they had been worshiping God, but they hadn't been worshiping Him from their heart. They hadn't been worshiping with a genuine, generous spirit. They hadn't been serving those around them. And if we come together as a church when we're able to be in person again, and we worship the Lord, and we're raising our hands, and we're singing God's praises, but we're not willing to help out our friends and neighbors to be for our city, that worship is displeasing to God. In fact, in Amos, it says that it wears God out, that it's draining. You've got a person in your life that you, you love them, but man, whenever you're around them, it's just it's, it's draining. God says that when we worship Him and we don't care for those around us, that it's draining to Him. There's another prophet that came up during this time of captivity. His name is Ezekiel. And when Ezekiel turned 30, he was in captivity. He was in exile. Now, Ezekiel would have been in a family of priests, and he would have been training to be a priest for his entire life. And then when he comes up on that moment, when it's time for him to become a priest, he, he has been carried off into captivity, and he starts his priestly service by an irrigation ditch in Babylon. And it, Ezekiel would be kind of like the seniors who've been working all year to graduate, and then it comes time for graduation, and graduation happens in the middle of a quarantine. And so... Ezekiel, his ministry is not going to look anything like what he expected it to look like. His ministry is not going to be anything like what he was, he was hoping for. But Ezekiel recognizes that he's been called for such a time as this. 
and he begins to deliver these messages from the Lord to the people that they need to hear. And friend, I know that right now this is not what we were expecting. This is not how we thought that this year was going to go. But God has a purpose for us in this. There, there's a reason for us to be here in this town, in this moment, with these connections that we have, connected to the people that we are connected to. We have a calling in this moment to meet the needs of our neighbors, to share the truth with them, and to see God do a powerful thing in their hearts and lives. Whether or not it's popular, whether or not it's easy. Charles Spurgeon, perhaps one of the most famous preachers of all time, um, Back in his day, he was so incredibly popular that after he would preach a sermon, that his sermon would be typed up and would be put in newspapers, periodicals. And even though he was in London preaching at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, his messages would be sent across the sea to America. And there was a, a circulation of his sermons in the hundreds of thousands in print, people buying his sermons or reading them in newspapers. I mean, it was like, like the original viral version of a sermon because there was no TV, there was no radio, people could only read it, but his sermons were so popular that they were being distributed all over. But this was happening in America during slavery. And Charles Spurgeon started preaching against slavery and the people in the United States were so angry that they started burning his books and burning his sermons. Now, Spurgeon had this incredible popularity, and it probably would have been tempting for him to say, well, I mean, I, I don't want to offend these people, and I want to continue to have the opportunity to share the message with them, and so I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk on those things because I know that that's a sticky issue. But Spurgeon continued to tell the truth because he loved people enough, all people enough, to care for them. And right now, our town, our city, needs us to be for them, to show them love, but also preach the gospel, preach the message of the truth. God has placed us in this town, in this time. God's given us these connections, this network of people who are watching these sermons online. There's a calling that God has for us, and it's not just for us to do what's popular or to do what will what will be well-liked, but it's for us to do what is loving, to care for people, to meet their needs, and tell them the truth. And so what we see in Jeremiah is that we are called to be for our city. We're to seek the peace, the flourishing of our city. And the only way for our city to truly flourish is not for it to have the material needs met, but to truly experience human flourishing, we've got to have our spiritual needs met. We've got to have our most basic need met. And our calling in Chandler is to love our city and to meet the physical, material needs all around us, but it's also to meet the greatest need in our community, the greatest need among our friends and neighbors, the greatest need among our families. It's a spiritual need. So let's truly be for people. Even in this time of exile, even in this time that we're not home yet, we're not where we belong, but we're looking toward a home that is, that is ahead one day, that Jesus is preparing for us, that we're headed to one day. We're looking towards that home, but let's be for those around us by bringing them along with us to that place of rest. Father, I pray you'd work in our hearts, Lord, that each one of us would be challenged we would feel called to be a channel of blessing, Lord, to be a, a people who seek the flourishing of those around us, who bring about true human flourishing through a spiritual awakening, or that we would not only meet material needs, but we would meet spiritual needs, or that we would do what people, what would, what we would let people know that they're loved, but also tell them the truth, Lord, help us to walk that fine line. Is there life a channel of blessing?
Make me.